MK Ultra Trauma Based Mind Control MK Ultra is a sadistic CIA project involves satanic ritual abuse. Victims are drugged, hypnotized, traumatized, given electric shock treatment, etc., to rewire their brain. These mind-controlled zombies have been used as spies, assassins, sex slaves, and even as celebrities. Throughout Project MK Ultra, CIA handlers have created Manchurian candidates willing to act on command, even against their own conscience. <sighs> you see... They started off small. They learn to manipulate us in little experiments and then they go nationwide or sometimes they start off statewide or local. They go to the whole United States. They try it on various small countries and now they're doing it on a worldwide scale. And I think they've actually been doing that for a long time but it's getting very, very intense. These are some of a few, a very few, there's millions more, some of the victims of MK Ultra mind control experiment upon America and upon, I mean, it's not just, the experiment isn't just for the, the people that it, they, they use, but they use the people as an experiment upon the public as well. Scientology is a CIA MK Ultra mind control project, as well as Jehovah's Witnesses. And the Mormons, after Brigham Young took them over, was a Freemason from the bad side. And many, many, the Moonies, the Unification Church. It was an MK Ultra mind control project in Korea. But this, these are the children, that, some of the children that they used here in America and around the world to destroy the minds of the other children. There's a few more. You can see them all using the hand sign, the Freemasonry sign of Satan and their one world government. These are just children. They don't know what they're doing. These are just children. Sarah Palin even. It's all a big experiment, guys. So some of you are slightly aware of all of this. It's just one of those ha-ha, strange things, who cares, interesting. What I'm about to show you is that it's a lot bigger than interesting or strange. This is so huge that... When you're done with this video, you'll wonder if you even know anything. And you might wonder just what kind of crazy tricks and lies and subterfuge are they playing upon us? And from whence comes this evil? Take a look. Were we all brainwashed by the CIA with sex, drugs, and rock and roll? You'll be surprised to find the answer. Did you know that LSD and hippies were invented by the CIA in the 1960s? No? Well, the idea was to hook kids on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Hey, it worked. So they would not overthrow the military-industrial complex. Huh, I don't know about that. They always tell us truth, thrown in with a bunch of ridiculousness. The idea wasn't really to overthrow the military-industrial complex. Uh, I don't think they even 
thought that people could do that, you know. But it was by controlling their minds that they would never wake up and notice it. And they could then take over the entire world. This went on and on with bigger and bigger projects. And we'll, we'll find out later what kind of projects it turned into. So accomplices in this diabolical scheme were in England, the Beatles, and in America, Jim Morrison, Frank Zappa, and other residents of Laurel Canyon in L.A. Joseph Flatley dove down this conspiracy rabbit hole to find out how this happened. By the way, another one of these uh, young people that was put into this program, this MK mind-altering thing, was Charles Manson. They experimented on that young homeless boy for years and years. They gave him drugs. And they put him just to experiment to see what would happen. They thought he looked like a type of cult leader type guy. He was impersonable. He had nothing, had nothing to lose. They brainwashed him. He led some girls out into the desert. No, this was a place, it was a movie set. He was in with very powerful people. Why would they let some homeless guy stay out there in this movie set? Why was he staying at the home of one of the Beatles? Or I should say the, the Beach Boys. He was in with the Beach Boys. He was very good friends. Some of his music was used in some of the rock and roll songs. He was literally probably going to be a... Well, I think they did never, never even planned on him being a rock and roll singer. But they certainly used him as well as the Beach Boys and the Beatles. All of these individuals were used. The Mamas and the Papas were a big part of this. And this uh, ski guy, uh, Polinsky, right? With this beautiful woman that he had much younger than him to make her famous. He was involved with Anton LaVey, the leader of the Church of Satan. And they had a cult down there in Los Angeles and San Francisco. This whole area was, was cultic. They made songs to promote America, you know, you know, uh, surfing USA. And, the, and it was a, to promote the United States and drugs and fun and free love and LSD. They wanted this to happen. And then in the meantime, they had a cult going on and there were People were dying. They were ritually sacrificing people. And then they, of course, had to blame it on somebody. It was a experiment to see just how far they could go to manipulate people's minds. They brought in Marilyn Monroe from some, what, she lived in Kansas or something? Brought her in and manipulated her. They all joined the Church of Satan. I don't know if you know that, but Marilyn Monroe was a friend of Anton LaVey, was uh, some sort of relationship with the Church of Satan as well as uh, some of those other girls that were famous and ended up dying. But that's not what we're talking about here. But I just wanted to point out that this is this is very deep. And you're probably never going to find an article somewhere that can cover the whole scope of this. But this is one that's pretty interesting and we'll just start with this. So... There is a guy from the CIA, and he's creeping around Laurel Canyon, Frank Zappa, plastic people. Oh, and by the way, this is where Charles Taze Russell sent his right-hand man, Judge Rutherford, before he died in some ritualistic death in, in a graveyard on Halloween night in Pampa, Texas. This is where Charles Russell had sent his right-hand man, to this area there in L.A. to create Hollywood. And they were bringing over these Germans, um, these Bavarians, they were bringing them over and they were creating the movie industry, uh, record players and phonographs and all of this stuff was just beginning there. They had a plan. From Charles Taze Russell bringing over these Germans, they began to start a cult there under... Aleister Crowley, and he was the sort of teacher in this mystery school that he created, whose students we now know as 
Anton LaVey, L. Ron Hubbard, Parsons, Von Braun. They started the CIA. They started NASA. They started Hollywood. All of these are integrated together as part of Project Paperclip. So, continuing here, it says, Were you aware that Jim Morrison, Frank Zappa, Papa John Phillips, and David Crosby were all children of high-ranking members of the American military? Hmm. Or that the Los Angeles neighborhood of Laurel Canyon, one time home to all of the above, was also the location of the Air Force 1352 photographic group? These factoids might not mean much to you, but according to the late conspiracy researcher David McGowan, they indicated a military psyop psychological operation, of mind-blowing proportions. McGowan, who died in 2015, laid out the theory on podcasts. Through his website, Center for an Informed America, CIA, get it? And later his book, Weird Scenes, Inside the Canyon, Laurel Canyon, Covert Ops, and the Dark Heart of the Hippie Dream, See, he would never have published any of this. They didn't want him to. Everything's set up. McGowan claims that the hippie movement of the 1960s was conceived in a government lab somewhere as a way to defuse the nascent anti-war movement. The plan was, simply put, to hook the kids on rock music and hard drugs, taking their minds off the revolution in the process. See, I think this is, even what we're reading here, is a psyop. Because... They know that we already can know this. We can get this information. There's going to be people gathering this information, like myself. And they're trying to throw me and others off the path by making us think that, well, they did it for a good reason. There was a war going on. They had to, right? And the military complex had things to do. We had to do the MK Ultra. We had to combat communism. So all this is baloney because the CIA and the KGB working together. Putin is also an operative as well as Trump. And I know you won't believe me, but you've got to open your mind and listen, friends. We don't have much time. We can't sit around and hang on to these ridiculous lies that they've been feeding us. Please, open your heart and your mind just enough to listen and see if what I'm saying doesn't make sense or what even what this article is saying should be enough to wake you up. So, uh... Their idea supposedly was to get them on rock and roll music, hard drugs, take their minds off the revolution in the process. Well, perhaps the individual most emblematic of this scheme was Jim Morrison. Morrison's essentially arrived on the scene as a fully developed rock star, complete with a backing band and stage persona, and an impressive collection of songs. Enough, in fact, to fill the Doctor's first few albums. McGowan writes how exactly Jim Morrison reinvented himself in such a radical manner remains something of a mystery. Jim Morrison's ban arrived on the scenes as a fully formed entity. The plan was simply put, to hook the kids on rock music and hard drugs, taking their minds off the revolution in the process. Perhaps it should be noted here that David McGowan was not a stand-up comic mocking the lunatic fringe of conspiracy theory, nor was he an acid casualty whose mind was blown after watching Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove no, not at all. He sincerely believed all of the above. And by the way, you're never going to find in any of these articles exposing any of this, the real culprits. They're never going to lead you to the real culprits. The, uh, the Polanskis, right? And the uh, Lewinskis, right? You remember this guy, the Unabomber, right? He was living out in the woods in a shed. And he was, remember the Unabomber? Some years ago, it was in the news all the time. Lewinsky. This is all set up. Everything's set up. And speaking of Lewinsky, that reminds me of, remember the the whole ordeal we went through back in the days with Bill Clinton uh, having uh, sex in the Oval Office with Lewinsky? Yeah, she, huh, with a blue dress. Remember the Lewinsky thing? They're all Inskys or Owskis or, or, or Bergs or Steins. Everything set up. That was just a psyop. I mean, the whole concept of Bill Clinton, you know, I did not have sex with that woman. 
You know, it was all a staged event. Now, I, I am not going to sit here and pretend I am psychologically competent to understand why they would do these kinds of things. But every one of these little charades have a reason. They have some sort of plan behind it. Just like the Whitewater scandal. That was just an experiment. They took people's money. They It was a local thing with some local banks and they they ripped people off and then there was a bubble that crashed and they all lost their money. The same thing, they just was a pre-trial run and then did it on the whole country in 2000, uh, yeah, 2008 when we went through that you know, collapse of the bank or whatever. Remember that? It's all set up, guys. We talked about the Diane Downs case. They, that poor woman never did what they're claiming she did. It's a mind control experiment upon the public to see if you guys will accept whatever they were feeding you. They could just tell you something on the news, tell you somebody did something, put him in prison, and we just accept it. Nobody would come to their aid. Nobody. They just want to see how far they can push it. Was General Jack D. Ripper the forerunner for David McGowan? Jack the Ripper? You make the call. <laughs> well, we won't watch that particular video. But McGowan doesn't tell us how he thinks Morrison made his stunning transformation. He merely notes how strange it is and leaves us to wonder about it. We'll have to look at the work of another conspiracy researcher for some insight into that process. John Coleman, in the tradition of so many conspiracy authors, claims that he first found out how the world really works while serving as an agent of Britain's Special Intelligence Service. After he got out, the story goes, he made, his, he made it his life's mission to expose the cabal of Jesuits, Freemasons, Jesuit Freemasons, intelligence agencies, and others that secretly run the world on the behest of the Queen of England. Of course, like the vast majority of the conspiracy culture, so-called whistleblowers, all we have to go by here is Coleman's word. Hmm, really? And how about all the evidence that we're going to cover? That's a little bit more than just his word. And judging by his bizarre theories, his word is most likely not to be trusted. Well, that's your opinion. The phenomenon of the Beatles, Coleman writes in his book, The Conspirators' Hierarchy was a carefully crafted plot to introduce by a conspiratorial body which could not be identified a highly destructive and divisive element into the large population group, targeted for change against its will. The Fab Four, according to Coleman, were the vehicle that social engineers from a think tank called the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations used to manipulate American youth. He labeled his plan the Aquarian Conspiracy, the Ten eared Coleman confidently states, nobody would have paid much attention to the motley crew from Liverpool and the 12 atonal system of music <laughs> that was to follow had it not been for an overabundance of press exposure. Mmm, yeah, they just, they just brought them out on the Ed Sullivan show and like, here you go, Beatles, you know, and everybody's like, ah, screaming, throwing their panties. It was all set up. Jim, you know, Jim Jones, uh, uh, all this stuff, as you'll see. So, the 12 atonal system consists, consisted of heavy, repetitive sounds taken from the music of the cult of Dionysus and the Baal priesthood by Adorno and given a modern flavor by this special friend of the Queen of England. See, they, they also brainwash us in other ways. While they're Running someone down, they say, oh, it's just terrible. In fact, it's so bad, it's kind of like the cult of Dionysus. Why call it a cult? See, Rome forbid the ancient mysteries. They murdered them and killed them like they did the witches and the wizards. Well, maybe we should find out who these people were, that they hated them so badly that they murdered them and crucified them like they did our Lord Jesus. And so they want you to think that this Dionysus cult is just another one of these satanic things. When in reality, it's all backwards. They're the cult. They're the mind brainwashers. They're the, the evil ones. And that's why you can't have, you know, these drugs are illegal. Right? Supposedly are illegal. But running, everyone's running around on LSD, supposedly, in, in the 1960s. Well, where'd they get it? They were handing it to them. The illegal drugs 
that you and I will go to prison for if we were to partake of them was being handed out on the street corner to the peasants and the individuals and and being and then used instead of for to activate your chakras and to to gain higher consciousness they were manipulated while they were under these trances and under the drugs they would manipulate them with pain they would get them see if you take these natural drugs naturally from nature the herbs the angels come and guide you to higher consciousness but when you take these chemicals that were not actually the actual drug, I mean, the LSD they were giving the kids weren't, they weren't the actual plant version. They're chemical versions that put you in a trance, like a mesmerization, hypnotism, and then they could brainwash them. And, and they had to use pain as well. They would, they would put screws in their heads and do all kinds of terrible things. But through this, they were able to mesmerize the, many people and make them murderers and 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 run around killing one another in cults and it was all created by the cia to put it on the television to make us feel like well you guys are so evil look you're all running around killing each other we're gonna have to have a military crackdown martial law that's just one of the aspects of this as we go on that i would hope you'd be aware of so Adorno and given a modern flavor by the special friend of the Queen of England and hence the Committee of 300. Tavistock and his Stanford Research Center created a distinct new breakaway, largely young population group, which was persuaded by social engineering and conditioning to believe that the Beatles really were their favorite group. All trigger words devised in the context of rock music were designed for mass control of the new targeted group, the Youth of America. In other words, these four talentless, in his view, Liverpudlians were recruited, dressed up, given silly haircuts, and paid to perform music specifically designed to brainwash the youth. And it worked. I guess that we're supposed to believe that after the process was perfected on the Beatles, it was taken to Southern California besides the Doors, McGowan implicates a large number of groups and musicians in this conspiracy theory, including The Birds, Frank Zappa, Crosby, Steels and Nash, Love, Graham Parsons, Neil Young, Poco, America. See, Neil Young, all these people were, everybody in the music business, the Hollywood, all these are, are, are family members from the Bohemian area over there in Germany, Bavaria, Switzerland. While McGowan doesn't presume to tell us precisely who is responsible for this plot, he does imply that it's the same military-industrial complex that escalated along with the Vietnam War. And by the way, I'm getting, I'm becoming convinced that when certain presidents like Truman or Eisenhower and Truman and Kennedy and stuff like that would warn the world, right? Supposedly Kennedy said he's going to take down the CIA, and then he got assassinated. And other presidents were warning about the industrial complex. I don't know if they weren't just given a paper and told to read it and then they were executed or taken off to the Epstein Island. I don't know. I don't even know if any of these guys actually died. They may have been part of the... Remember, they play good cop, bad cop. So maybe they want us to believe that there were good presidents after all. Well, you voted them in, but, but there's bad guys that got rid of them. See, it's these darn bad guys, but they never expose who the bad guys are. And, um, you know, I've been hearing a lot of things lately that's making me wonder. For instance, the whole Flat Earth movement was started by one of these Bavarians, which is very peculiar and odd to me because it's always that way. Remember, way back, I don't know how many years ago when this whole thing started, like, uh, what was it, Velenkowski in um, Collision of the Worlds or something. I don't remember the name of that book. Velenkowski wrote this big book about, you know, a precursor to, to Nibiru and all this kind of stuff. Well, that guy was a Bavarian, same same nationality, right? And then we come, we had the Van Daniken for a while, we had the Chariots of the Gods and so In other words, another Bavarian with another theory, which, which had, you know, probably 80% truth, right? Awakening people's minds to other realities. But in the end, it was more or less controlled opposition to, to take you down a road that wasn't actually true, see? And same thing with the Flat Earth. Yeah, 
NASA is a lie and everything that the government's telling us is a lie. But that doesn't mean the Earth is flat. See, it's just a it's just a controlled operation to get us to believe in some other lie. So then we had this Stitchin or Sitchin or whatever his name was. Well, I even kind of started thinking that that this was real for a little while, but it was all made up. There is no Nibiru. Nibiru in Sumerian tongue is Nippur. And that's a city over there by Babylon, the city of Nippur. And their god was Jupiter. That's how they said Jupiter. Nibiru is Jupiter. It shows up in the sky, goes around the sun every, tw or it goes around, comes back around in the same spot every 12 years. So it's in one of the zodiac signs every, every year it's in a different zodiac sign. So it was like the boat that brought the souls into the world or something. They had these beliefs. It wasn't a asteroid that was coming to destroy the world or anything like that. But I digress. There are all kinds of things like this. For instance, I was talking to a friend a couple of days ago uh, about the book that supposedly was written in 1800 about a president, the last president, whose name would be Trump. He would have a son named Baron. He would be the last president. He'd have a castle on Fifth Avenue. I mean, everything was was detailed prophetic. Everything about it. The riots, the end of the world, all the stuff was written in a book. Well, if you do some investigation, and I've been saying this, this was a prophecy, but as I do more investigation, I begin to realize this book was never, there's no way to prove this book ever existed until recently. It was if you look it up, they say it was printed, originally written in 1800. But there's no proof of that. They just say that. But it wasn't actually printed until recently, after they started saying, after Trump came along. Now, it's a little bit like we were talking about, well, then the same thing with the Elon Musk, or, or I should say Von Braun, supposedly wrote a book about someone named Elon that would take the world to Mars. But there's no real proof of any of this. And remember the story about how, you know, the Simpsons predicts everything. How, how in the world could the Simpsons predict everything? Like Trump would be president and all this kind of thing. Well, here's my question. Here's my um, idea that I would like to propose. If there are anyone out there, is there anyone out there that actually witnessed that Simpson cartoon when it was aired or did they after the fact go back it's a cartoon for Pete's sake they could make up a cartoon years later and claim that it was aired years before we don't know that I don't have proof of that but I would like to see if there is any proof of that that if they're not just manipulating the narrative talk about a Mandela effect maybe they're just doing all this on purpose guys anyway I digress let's go back to what we were saying here so the military industrial complex that escalated along with the Vietnam War, getting a major assist from Jen Morrison's father, Admiral George Stephen Morrison. Jim Morrison and his dad. I'll be darned. So this little guy had a military father. You know who my favorite singer is, guys? His name is John Denver. I've, I've been saying that for since I was a kid. John Denver. I love that guy. I listened to all of his songs, learned all of his music. I mean, I totally, really, really loved his music. But I always wondered, it's kind of interesting. You know what his real name was? He said some German name, Dusseldorf or something, right? Kind of like Trump, Dorf. I think Trump's name was Dorf or something. Well, I remember hearing that John Denver's dad was in the military, high up in the military, just like Jim Morrison, and came onto the scene just like all the rest and went to stardom out of nowhere was running around giving you know uh, talks at the at the UN and stuff i have to wonder and i and i think that i'm probably uh right to say that that all again that was all a setup and 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 so john Denver supposedly died in a in an airplane accident do you really think he did i don't i don't think any of these people actually died John Lennon, I don't, I don't know. If he did die, they either died because they were executed. Marilyn Monroe was either executed. John F. Kennedy was either executed or it was a plot. 
that they pretended that they died. Like Elvis, these individuals. All these guys died. Why? Because this was an experiment. The CIA was experimenting on these people. I wouldn't be surprised if they used these poor children and then killed them. But they could just be very high up individuals with their fathers and mothers in the elite military people or other elite CEOs or billionaires or whatever that, whose children become famous. A lot of Hollywood people who become famous have very powerful billionaire fathers, but we just never hear about it. So it says, according to this New York Times obit, the elder Morrison commanded American naval forces in the Gulf of Tonkin when the destroyer Maddox engaged three North Vietnamese torpedo boats on August 2nd, 1964. A skirmish and confused reports of a second engagement two days later led President Lyndon B. Johnson to order airstrikes against North Vietnam and to request from Congress that what became known as the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, allowing him to carry out further military operations without declaring war. So basically, Morrison, his dad, started the whole war. <laughs> Pretty high up in the military, I'd say. The Times fails to mention that the operation was under the aegis of something called Oplan 34A, a series of covert operations targeting North Vietnam. These attacks were carried out by South Vietnamese mercenaries and special forces, with the United States in a support and advisory role. As Douglas Valentine points out in the Phoenix program, this role included placing Navy SEALs in the South Vietnamese unit. As is always the case, the use of advisory were here was little more than a pretext for putting American boots on the ground in the days before it was legal. According to McGowan, while Admiral Morrison was overseeing military operations in the Gulf of Tonkin, Operations which, depending on who you believe, either accidentally or purposefully drew us into war in Vietnam. His son was being used as a tool to crush the peace movement at home. Jim Morrison crushing the peace movement with Peace Frog. Hmm. Following the web from the United States Navy through Jim Morrison leads us to Frank Zappa. This connection was facilitated by Zappa's wife, Gail, who, like Jim Morrison, was the child of a naval officer. They're all child of somebody important. In fact, as Barry Miles revealed in Zappa, a biography both Jim and Gail used to play together in the same naval kindergarten in Virginia, where Frank, according to Frank, Gail once hit Jim on the head with a hammer. Frank Zappa's father arrived in the United States from his native Sicily in 1908, a graduate of the University of North Carolina. Mr. Zappa spent his life in the employ of the U.S. military establishment. As McGowan writes, this eventually brought him to the West Coast, where the family lived for a time in Lancaster, California. McGowan points out, and I suppose this is important, but he never says how, that other past residents of Lancaster included Clarence White, who replaced Graham Parsons in The Birds. Parsons? Is that the guy that started NASA? Probably related. Dewey Bunnell of A Horse With No Name, Infamy, and Captain Beefheart himself, Don Van Villet, or Villet. McGowan also claims that the city of Lancaster is right alongside Edwards Air Force Base. Although this isn't accurate, the base is 22 miles northeast of the city. Close enough. As it so happens, the Area 51 is under the administration of Edwards Air Force Base. So, perhaps Zappa, Van Villet, etc. All were working for whoever it is that's been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology since the Roswell incident in 1947. Well, that's probably a big hoax too, guys. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. 1968, Frank and Gail Zappa were living at 2401 Laurel Canyon Boulevard in a home referred to as the Log Cabin. The structure began life as a roadhouse in the early 20th century and was later the home to silent movie cowboy Tom Mix and his horse, Tony. The 2,000 square foot, five level house featured an 80 foot long living room and a bowling alley in the basement. It was here, according to McGowan, that Frank hosted a perpetual saloon attended by virtually every musician 
who passed through the canyon in the mid to late 1960s. You know, that reminds me of uh, my other favorite singer, Jim Croce, who looks a lot like Frank Zappa. I mean, seriously, same mustache, same, they could be brothers. And, you know, I, I remember reading stories about how, and he was killed and murdered as well, Jim Croce. But I remember hearing the story how Jim Croce, before he died, used to have these big parties and everybody would come and they'd drink and, and you know, do pot or LSD or whatever. And they would, they would write music. Same kind of thing, like the little log cabin th situation. And I, of course, at the time, I thought, oh, that was just a nice guy with his friends and they're all getting together. But you see, somebody was organizing all these things, just like the Charles Manson thing. And, 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 and they were always using property that belonged to the higher ups from Bavaria and organized by individuals that have financial backing from these banks. So, um, Frank hosted a perpetual saloon attended by virtually every musician who passed through the canyon in the mid to late 1960s. McGowan portrays Zappa as a rigidly authoritarian control freak and a supporter of U.S. military actions in Southeast Asia, who used his role, roles as a producer label head and one of the most famous freaks in America to bring down the anti-war movement. Of course, there's nothing to the rumor that Zappa supported the Vietnam War, but why let that ruin a good story? Plastic People, the Mothers of Invention from the Absolutely Free album. Isn't it weird that they were trying to, through music, tell people to be free, but what they were really saying is, be rebellious and evil. I know it, a lot of people say, no, I believe in the free movement and the hippies, and I do too, in the sense of what I wanted to believe. It was free, uh, as in good, and and because and, everyone everybody wants to be free, and of course, herbs are good, but the thing is, they weren't doing herbs. They were doing some chemical invented by the CIA, and it wasn't really about freedom. It was about rebellion, and there is no God. And freedom to do anything like, I don't know, anything, right? Like things that would, like, how about abortion? That, you know, free to, to, to kill your baby or something. You know, it's this kind of thing. It was twisted logic. And that's how it always is. You couldn't convince people of evil if you just presented evil to them and said, take it. You'd have to manipulate their mind to, 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 to believe. You have to deceive them. So the world of conspiracy theory is big one is big on establishing connections. The idea being that any time two things relate to each other, that relationship must be meaningful. See how they're trying to manipulate us right here into thinking that maybe this is all just coincidence. That is why the fact that Jim Morrison lived in Laurel Canyon at some point and that his father may have basically started the Vietnam War can't be a coincidence. There's a logical fallacy in some, in there somewhere. But I can't seem to find my copy of why people believe weird things. So I'll leave that for another time. In other words, he can't disprove this, so he goes on. So the conspiracy researcher's gig is to see the connections to see reality for what it really is and then present it to the rest of us innocent fools so that we might learn the truth. And the truth shall set us free, as David Icke. Oh, so now that's a, a, a quote from David Icke? I thought the truth will set you free with something Jesus Christ said. Sorry, David, but, you know, they're going a little too far there, don't you think? A British conspiracy theorist who claims a secret world government is run by undercover blizzard people <laughs> once insisted. See, they're going to harp on that for the rest of the man's life so that all the truth that he's been telling us will be made to sound ridiculous because, after all, how stupid is it to think that they're lizard people? McGowan's work is generally little more than a litany of these connections, unsourced and hard to put into proper perspective. What are we to make of the fact that some have claimed that J. Edgar Hoover frequented a brothel in, can in the canyon, or that Frank Zappa's father once worked at the Edwood Arsenal Chemical Warfare Facility, where the U.S. military conducted MK Ultra type experiments on human subjects? What are we to make of that? Oh, don't worry, it's just a big coincidence. McGowan doesn't really tell us. He just piles it on. Well, how would he know? There's no way. What are we going to do? 
get a camera and, and film them doing the dirty deed. We don't have that. But we have the evidence, and it's very clear. And then he throws Charlie Manson and, for some reason, Harry Houdini into the mix. Well, I think he probably was on to something there with the Charlie Manson thing. And, of course, Harry Houdini has connections to the whole thing as well. Let's reconsider that some passage from weird scenes quoted earlier. Morrison essentially arrived on the scene as a fully developed rock star. Remember the, the, the heavyweight champion Tommy Morrison? I wonder if he has any connection. I know, you're, you're grasping for straws, Dave. Well, you know, I'm not really. I, I'm, I'm suspicious of everybody now. Everybody. Um, he arrived on the scene as fully developed rock star, complete with a backing band, a stage persona, and an impressive collection of songs. Well, we read all that, didn't we? So let's go down here. McGowan spends a lot of time being blown away by the fact that the Doors, a group of, in his opinion, no-talent non-musicians, hacks, led by a guy who can't even read music, is somehow responsible for some of the most enduring classics of the 1960s rock. One has to wonder if McGowan had ever bothered cracking open any of the gazillion books about the Lizard King, not to mention listen to any of their albums. If he did, he'd surely know how the Doors evolved from Ray Manzarek's bar band, Rick and the Raven and how Morrison was referred to by his fellow UCLA film school students as the pudgy Navy brat. Another Navy brat? Until he moved out on the beach, stopped eating, and started writing songs while flying high on LSD. He also seems to have had some sort of eating disorder, at least during his rock god heyday. McGowan, it turns out, only believes that the band appeared out of nowhere because he knows nothing about the band. That's kind of par for the course with his book. So because this guy made a statement that sounded like he didn't know one point somewhere along the line, we're going to discredit the entire thing that the man was talking about. I don't think so. Now, see, there you go. Is that Jim Croce or Frank Zappa? I mean, he looks like the same Jim Croce. It could be any of these guys. They all have the same look. As I have listened to McGowan's podcast appearances and plowed through his extremely dense writing on the Laurel Canyon conspiracy, see, even the word dense there sounds like a dumb thing. Like, oh, you dunce. That's what it sounds like. But the word literally means condensed. There's a lot of stuff here in his uh, argument that would actually be evidence for what he's saying. Uses words to throw you off the track. I'm struck by how bizarre his conclusions are. He doesn't realize it, but there is a fascinating story here. And it's right under the author's own nose. The Laurel Canyon scene was at its heart, built by the sons and daughters of the military industrial complex. Hmm. Many of whom were relatively well-to-do and, and or lucky enough to circumvent the draft, who formed their own little community for a brief time in a very special place. It was often times a very dysfunctional scene, and it didn't last very long, but while it did... It was rather remarkable. McGowan, a lifelong smoker, died on November 22nd, 2015, six months after being diagnosed with lung cancer. His fans on the internet suspect that this too was a secret government plot. Might have been. Or maybe they were just freaked out by that date, November 22nd, the anniversary of the JFK assassination. Maybe they were. Wow. Huh, okay. Well, that is all very interesting. And I think uh, very clearly indicating that what we're saying is true. But I got something else you should probably listen to. Because this isn't really speculation. Once you've heard this next piece, you realize this has all been documented. And Congress knows about it. And the Senate knows about it. And all the important peoples know about it. But they don't care. Well, they're orchestrating it. So let me play you a, a, a voice clip of a Senate hearing or the Congress. I don't know where it was. It's, this is about Jonestown, Jim Jones. Remember the whole thingy thing there with Jim Jones? That was a CIA plot, and it's much deeper than just that. But take a listen. If I had appeared on a 
uh, public television uh, several months ago with a group of uh, black professionals, mostly uh, psychologists and doctors. They invited me to appear today to provide information that they thought might be, uh, that I might be able to help with this forum today, with their research. Uh, I appeared in Washington in February before the International Relations Committee and uh, made some statements and some charges and documentation which resulted in the Foreign, Relations, Foreign Affairs Committee, or International Relations Committee, whatever they call it, today. Uh, they voted to ask the House Select Committee on Intelligence to investigate my charges. And they are currently investigating those charges by the House Select Committee on Intelligence. Can you tell us what the charges are? Well, the charges basically amounted to uh, CIA contact with both the Burnham government there and with the People's Temple. Uh, that originally, it was my belief at the time I went to Washington, that the purpose of our involvement there was to support the government of Burnham for a commercial reason. And uh, they used the People's Temple almost as enforcers to help support an unpopular government there to keep control of the government of Guyana. Uh, the, we knew that the, there had been an article in the San Mateo Times in December of 79, which indicated that the deputy chief of mission there, Richard Dwyer, uh, was in fact the CIA station chief. And he was the one that went to Jonestown with Leo's party. And he claimed to be slightly wounded, but there was a tape made at the time of the murders and suicides there with Jones yelling, get Dwyer out of here, get Dwyer out of here. And the indications are that it was Dwyer who went back into Jones after he was murdered and was there at the time. And there's great questions, just who shot Jim Jones and why, whether Jones was shot to shut him up. Uh, the question also as to how all these people died and just when they died, which is all documented here. But soon I came back from Washington because of my testimony. I started getting documentation from a Berkeley psychologist called the Penal Colony here, and from the Alliance for Preservation of Religious Liberty in Washington, which indicated other things, one of which was that George Philip Blakey uh, was a top Jones aide. He was the man who arranged the purchase or the lease of the land in Guyana, provided the money and arranged the lease down there in 1974. He also was tracked now as being a CIA operative in uh, Angola in 1975 with Unita. But he's also, he's also the same guy who was the top aide who arranged all this purchase in the finances, is also the husband of Deborah Layton Blakey, who fled Jonestown and made those charges. He's the brother-in-law of Larry Layton, who was, who was acquitted yesterday. And it's interesting to note that the Peninsula Times Tribune says, Yesterday, the jury of queer, uh, in a pudding late, the jury appeared to have agreed with the defense contention that Leighton was brainwashed and drugged at the time of the shootings could not be held criminally responsible. But the gist of what I'm getting to is this. I've received a lot of documentation, which I will value here today, that indicates the, poss the strong possibility that Jonestown and the People's Temple was, in reality, a mass mind control experiment conducted by the CIA as a follow-up to something called MK Ultra, which they conducted from the early 50s through 1974. They used to use the VA hospital and state hospitals. They used the federal and state penitentiaries for their experiments. Do you think that Jim Jones was actively involved with the CIA? I do now. Would you elaborate? Uh, the... I will... Let me read you one quotation. Uh, well, I read it at the end. It's a quotation from the book, The Strongest Poison. But we, Jones gave, a rep we had reports before he went down to Guyana that Jones had given a million dollars to Burnham. The only other connection was between Burnham and Jones. We thought it was based on money. We don't know where Jones got all that money. We know, for example, that Jones spent at least nine months down in Brazil, I think it was, either in the late 60s or early 70s, after which he came back with the money to start the Mendocino operation of the People's Temple. And uh, we're starting to have the linkage between, uh, we have Blakey, who was his top assistant, one of his top assistants, over in Angola with the CIA. We have Wire down there, the station chief of CIA. They had a covert operation. If they had to have a, with Wire, they had to have a covert operation which was not reported to Congress. Now, the Hughes-Ryan Act of 1974 and said they had to report all CIA covert operations to the oversight committees. That was Leo's legislation. He co-authored that. 
There was no such report of a covert operation in Angola, I mean, in, in, in Guyana, meaning, I brought this out in Washington, one of the things they're checking into in Washington now, that the CIA broke the law if it had a covert operation there, did not report it to these oversight committees. So what we have here is, uh, you know, Leo goes down there, and uh, the question is, uh, uh, was Dwyer there? And Dwyer came here from Thailand. He was with the CIA since 1959 in Guyana. We have photographs of Dwyer with his arms around Marceline Jones and Jim Jones out there. We have Jones, we have Dwyer going back to Jonestown after the other shooting, and Jones getting wiped out. And what we're trying to, we now have an admission back with the Senate Intelligence Committee, for example, that they now admit that Dwyer, that Dwyer was CIA and is CIA. If Jones were... Yeah, what, what I'm doing is this. You're asking a question on CIA and the, and the definite involvement. They always deny it. Well, they denied that Dwyer was a CIA agent when I first charged it. They now admit it. They only admit what you can prove. We have here a copy of a document called Who's Who in the CIA, one of these attachments here, listing Dwyer as CIA since 1959 and where he's been. Well, let me get back to my original question. I asked you, since you made the statement that you felt the CIA was using People's Temple as an experiment. I said, I said so that I, my be, question was, did, was Jim Jones aware of it? Was he part of that experiment? If that experiment existed, because I'm saying to you that this, this, this possibly is a race, strong possibly is a race. I'm inclined to believe it. I can't be sure, but I'm saying yes, that if such an experiment was there, Jones would have had to have been part of it and would have had to have led that experiment. Let me read to you this one statement from Jones which is quoted in a guy, I hate to give you the source because it's uh, the book The Strongest Poison by uh, by Mark Lane, and I know that Lane has lied in other parts of his book from personal experience. But there's a statement here, which you can read here, uh, about uh, Jones' claim that he was a true and loyal and patriotic American of the terrible shame was obligated to remain in Guyana, and the world people would never know what a patriot he was. This is a statement from Jones, down in Jonestown. So we're, what I would like to have you do, uh, this is what I'm doing here, is it's very difficult for me to uh, sort of shorthand uh, this much documentation, but I'm, all I'm really doing is suggesting to you that I'm making this statement today to this forum. I've asked them to take the documentation I've attached to consider going in and, and viewing this data and conducting a further investigation on their own, especially in the black community, among survivors, among relatives of that, to see what elements they can find there, to see to either corroborate or disprove these statements about the uh, mind control experiment in Jonestown. Do you see any significance in the fact that Jones did his recruiting and had his temple in the black community insofar as an experimental situation that the CIA might have been involved in its concern? I'm not sure that he started there deliberately. I think it's possible, more likely, that he had uh, something going already at church going, and that if they were going to try to use cults or religious groups for this experimentation, they may have looked around for likely candidates who were already in action, already in operation, and they may look at somebody who was a charismatic leader type, and I don't think that he was started off this way. I think he may have, they may have watched his career and uh, then decided to approach him. I think it would be more likely that he was already underway. Do you have any conclusions as to how the people died in Jonestown? Yes, uh, I have part of our documentation here uh, is a report from, uh, which is uh, attached here. The chief medical examiner in Guyana is Dr. Leslie Moto. He reported, and this is attached here, his opinion that more than 700 of those bodies found at Jonestown were not suicide victims but were murdered. They have based this on the injection marks in the upper arm. Page four of my, of my uh, statement here. By injection, like Yes, and by, and by, uh, and, and by uh, gunfire. There were a lot more people killed by gunfire than they've ever admitted so far. We had heard reports that there, had, there were 50 of them, approximately 50 men with guns ringing around there so people couldn't get out, and very few of them did get out. Uh, so it's our, con according to the uh, chief medical officer in Guyana, most of the people down there were murdered rather than suicide. Who is suppressing all of this? Are you uh, implying the CIA was active in suppression? Yes, I'm suggesting to you that uh, a lot of things that don't make sense here, I'm suggesting that 
the long delay and anyone getting in, the press getting in there, or very many people all getting in there for several days, was caused by a deliberate attempt to manufacture the story, which has now been accepted and sold successfully to the American people. And what is that story that you think the people are falsely accepting? That, in effect, this was a large group of uh, uh, disillusioned or uh, uh, rather uh, 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 disoriented black people who went down to Guyana and who turned their backs in this country and committed suicide, and uh, we might as well we're good, we're, we're get rid of them, and that's just an aberration type of thing. I think that's the story that's been peddled. Uh, when, you, when you see the documentation here, you'll begin to wonder yourselves why the first reports were 350 people died or 400 people died and for several days that was reported and then they started finding more bodies when the first reports were the 500 foot in the jungle the people examined the bodies the first time and counted them counted them by name by not the heights of people men women and children turned them over then a few days later they claimed to have found uh two or three stacks of bodies underneath those you know, it, uh, it, it boggles the mind, the stories that were passed out, but they apparently have uh, gotten away with, I think, with one of the greatest fabrications of, of, of recent years. And what do you think was really going on there? What do you think is going on? Uh, whatever happened at Jonestown, I believe that our government through the CIA was in close touch with Jones before he left this country, that our government helped him to get established down there, ignored the reports of brutality, ignored the reports of guns being run down and drugs being sent down there, that our government used Jones, if nothing at the minimum, to keep control of the government of Guyana for the prime minister we wanted down there. At the maximum, the possibility is that we may also have used it for a mass mind control, exper mass mind control experiment. Do you think there is any connection between this surmise and the Larry Layton acquittal? There is, but I can't quite figure out which it is. Uh, I never have figured that Larry Layton would ever be convicted of anything. He'll never be tried in this country. I think the long length of time it took to bring him to trial was so they could get everything in order so they could arrange uh, for uh, nothing to come out, as has happened. Uh, now, whether Layton was the innocent victim and was a setup, or whether he was actually under drugs, as they say here in this article, I don't know. There's a report in what I have attached here that actually were blanks in his gun. He was uh, waving a blank gun around and firing a blank gun. He may have been a setup. Uh, this thing is so weird. It's such a never, never world that I really can't, uh, except that I believe that our government worked with the government of Guyana to bring about an acquitted verdict down in by Larry Lake, and I don't think I'll ever be tried in this country for Leo's murder or anything else. What significance do you attach to the fact that the leadership of the temple was largely white and the membership of the temple was largely black? Well, I mentioned that, and in here, I think that that's part and parcel of the whole thing. I think that uh, this is what caused me very suspicious about this whole experiment, about, this whole, about the, the possibilities here. You know, the, the cadre was all white, and yet we think of Jonestown as a bunch of black people who were committed suicide without mentioning that white cadre. And that doesn't quite add up. I think, that's, I think there are racist overtones of the whole thing. What kind of racist overtones? What are you exactly alleging? I'm alleging that the media picture that was printed, that it was painted rather, and then brought him out in print and so on, was that uh, you don't have to worry about these people because they're crazy, they'll do anything, and they're not like us. How far will the Congress take over? I don't know. Bill Royer has been pushing hard on it. He's the man who was elected to take Leo's place, and uh, uh, he's been doing a good job. I now have Don Edwards interested and a few others back there interested, and uh, they're starting to get interested because uh, uh, they're very busy, but all of a sudden they're starting to realize there's more to this. It's now before the select committee in the House. I don't expect much to come of that because they're very close to the CIA, but uh, at least we're... Uh, we're uh, we're making some uh, headway. We're, we're, we keep it going. Do you feel threatened in as much as you're uh, exposing the CIA here? <laughs> I don't know whether to feel threatened or not. Uh, if what I uh, think is true, then possibly I'm in some danger. But except uh, by getting it out in the open, I think that uh, the danger would, to me, if there is any, would recede because uh, 
that way they uh, I'd be I might become too visible if they were to if anything would happen I might have an accident but you know I I can't worry about that anymore than Leo could worry about it you have to just go ahead and do what you think is right before Leo Ryan left for Jonestown on that trip there had been a press conference three blocks from where we're sitting right now in the People's Temple where Mark Lane and Marceline Jones had alleged that the CIA was engaged in a campaign to destabilize Jonestown to invade it to attack it to destroy the social experiment that they portrayed Jonestown as having been. Were you, as Representative Ryan's aide and Representative Ryan himself, aware of those allegations? Did you lend any credence to them? Did you have any knowledge yourselves of, of possible CIA involvement in any way of this? We had no knowledge or any thought of any CIA involvement. We knew the charge was being made. We deemed those to be Lane's charges to prevent Leo's trip, to prevent Leo from finding out what was actually the truth, whatever it was at Jonestown. And, however, we were mindful enough of it that Thursday night before Leo went down there, we had a meeting with Don Harris, the NBC TV crew, over at the airport Hilton Hotel, and we discussed possible violence at Jonestown. And because of Mark Lane's charges that uh, Leo's trip was going to be a CIA trip, an invasion, it was decided that evening by Leo and Don Harris and myself and others who were going, Bob Brown and others who were killed down there, that uh, not to take any guns, including handguns, because any guns along might have meant that they could have uh, claimed that, they, that that provocation was started by the Ryan delegation. So it was decided not to take any guns, and that we did put enough credence in McLean's charges to try to defuse them so there would be no possibility of their being believed. Do you have a theory about uh, those 350 bodies and then the delay and then the 900? Did something happen between one wave of killings and the next? Uh, there is a... I should preface this by saying that there can be a hundred theories and then another hundred theories on top of it. The evidence or the statements here that are attached here seem to indicate the possibility that there was an attempt at suicide drills, the suicide drills, the actual carrying out of the suicide, some of which worked and some of which didn't. That more than, that some of the people may have fled off into the jungle in sizable numbers trying to get away. And those people may have later been found and brought back and their bodies added to the original bodies. Was there any autopsy results that might indicate the time of death? No, the, uh, that's also attached here. The, uh, no autopsies were performed, and uh, we had, uh, when our medical examiners went in, they did not perform autopsies, and we, that's one of the questions as to why not. What was the uh, drug experiment? Can you be more trying to understand it here? MK, what was it called? From 1953 to 1974, the CIA conducted experiments under something called MK Ultra Program. You recall the LSD experiment in this country, people jumping out of windows, and the LSD experiment that George White, who was Colonel of Narcotics here, uh, conducted around the country, around parts of the world. This was control of individuals, control of groups, control of whole populations. This was. We have scientists in this country and elsewhere, including the back in the Nazi Germany, that believe you can control behavior. The shades of what they call the brave new world. And there have been experiments in prisons, uh, in uh, hospitals uh, along those lines. But uh, this is what they were doing, okay? Is not called lithium, the drug? Well, there were, that was one of the several. I have a whole list of drugs that were used as experiments here. So. By 1974, the American Civil Liberties Union and other groups and lawsuits had forced the government to stop these programs using prisons and hospitals. And uh, Helms, then the director of the CIA, said that they, were term they had lost interest in mind because they were terminating it. The charge attached here is, and the things that I received, was they then went over into the private sector and started going into the matter of cults the religious groups and conducting their experiments there. I don't know what the initials stand for. It's MK Ultra, and uh, I know that people in Washington are very familiar with it. Before that, they had something called Operation Artichoke, which included uh, killing a prominent American politician, <laughs> just as an experiment. Uh, something called Cohen Pro, Cohen Tell Pro, Pro, Cohen Tell Pro, and others. Documentation, notes, somebody keeping notes on the results of the test. Yes, oh yes, and they have some of the, we have attached here some of those actual protocols and some of those results that they were gotten under Freedom of Information Act. And uh, so I think when you read the, especially the one from uh, the last, the penal colony and the one from April, from the uh, Associate Preservation of Religious Liberty, 
uh, you'll see the reason why I felt moved to do something. I should say that I first heard these reports right after the tragedy in Guyana, within a few months, and I just believed them. I just thought it was ridiculous, and I just, for a year I paid no attention to it. Until uh, then I heard about the uh, wire being down there and going back in and realized it was a covert operation. Then I testified in Washington in, in February, and then I got this material. I've only been on this trail for two months now, uh, but it's all come because of my because of my testimony in Washington. The other things were, were starting to, the more we talk, the more we, find, we, the more we find out, the more information comes to us. I'm here today to ask the help of this group this black professional leadership group and their for after their assistance in finding out more. I'd say it was a mixed reaction. They were some of them were some of them were suspicious that I was who, who I was. Was I really uh, trying to divert attention? You see, from uh, what the reality was. Uh, some I think I think generally I think they were receptive and they, I think they're going to go along and decide. Uh, when you say divert from the reality. What do you mean? Well, uh, they were concerned that I was trying to maybe uh, 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 somehow uh, suggest. Uh, See, I plot just to, uh, uh, there might be some other truth to it, and that I was here, sent here to uh, divert attention from uh, whatever reality it might be. Would you, would you be kind enough to, uh, yeah, to summarize what you think <clears throat> was being done to the people, sample people, through the CIA? You started to say use of drugs, but what do you think really happened down there in the way of the mind control? I think they were conducting... Uh, you know, I really believe that there's a strong possibility, I'll put it this way, without being able to prove it. It's my impression this time that they were conducting some sort of uh, mind control experiments. For example, they had a very modern hospital done, which they bragged about. So modern that in that population, they had medical checkups for, for everyone every day. So there's no need for that unless you're conducting experiments where you're having control groups and you're giving people, and they gave them their, they're giving their vitamins every day. And it's my guess that they were just using them as guinea pigs to see what they could do under isolated circumstances. They'd take them off into a jungle someplace far away from everybody, they get them there somehow, and then they're able to see how these various drugs work on different groups. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, because of the medical checkups every day and a large number of drugs that I found down there, I'm inclined to believe that there was a mind control experimentation going on. And because of the links we now have through Dwyer and through Philip Blakey, I'm inclined to see some CIA involvement there. Whether that adds up to a full-scale government program of mind control, or not, I do not know. But there's enough there that needs to be investigated thoroughly. What are the implications for other uh, cults and organizations that we now have here in Northern California, such as, for example, the Moonies, who just had a, a national leader elected of the Moonies, the Harry Krishnas in Berkeley, who it turns out have uh, submachine guns, uh, and other organizations like that. Are you, do you think there's a possibility that there's some relationship between the kind of thing hey, you're talking about? These uh, documents uh, claim that. Uh, just a moment, please. I would like to copy if you were. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, the statements are made in here that the uh, CIA, Korean CIA, they tab as the money source for the Moonies, for the Reverend Sung Young Moon. Uh, they, they, uh, they talk about Synanon and some of, some of Synanon's experimentation. Now, whether or not this is uh, a part and parcel, they, they question Moonies, they question Synanon, they question the great growth of the cult movement in the early 70s, about the time they were swinging away, that, well, I thought they were closing down, supposedly, the CIA MK Ultra program. So what, what are you doing? Real estate development. Industrial real estate development. Yeah. What exactly are the reasons that you think that Leighton, that you expected Leighton to be acquitted? Well, primarily, that uh, uh, as a surviving member of the People's Temple and somebody that he was dangerous to the authorities. He didn't know anything and talked on the grounds that, that they were going to, that they were going to execute him or put him long term in prison. He just might talk to, uh, to get even or to prevent being sent to prison or being executed. So I think that Leighton, uh, uh, for two reasons. One is Leighton knew, may have known too much, and besides that, uh, you find that his father. <laughs> I like to give you this one at this time, just a little follow-up. Uh, Philip Blakey was his brother-in-law. His father is Dr. Lawrence Layton. 
And uh, Dr. Von Clayton is former chief of biochemistry and director of chemical warfare at the U.S. Army Dugway Proving Ground in Utah in the early 1950s. More recently, Dr. Layton has worked as a research scientist at the Western Regional Research Laboratory for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Berkeley, California. So you're tying uh, Mr. Here's Dr. Layton is uh, chief of biochemistry and director of chemical warfare for the United States Army at a time that we had MK Ultra being started. But then you said earlier that you thought uh, Layton might have been under drugs and he might have had uh, yes. blanks in his yeah. gun. Would they have done that with his father? They. Uh, the blanks in the gun would fit there because then it could prove he didn't fire anything, right? But what about him being on drugs and then no, I, experiments? I don't know. I, I'm only postulating uh, here. I'm only guessing. But, you know, the what is interesting to me is the way that this Leighton, Blakey family is so tied into everything. And when you have key operatives, if you do have operatives, they, they have to be pretty, pretty tightly held, your key people. Do you have any theories about uh, Tim and Grace Stone that fit into this at all? about Tim Stone. Uh, I know that Tim was, uh, I saw a picture of Tim as a young man picked up in East Germany in East Berlin back in the mid-50s as a student back there. Then he came back here and he gave up his Porsche and he gave up his good job and he went and joined Jim Jones. Uh, and the big fight that caused, uh, supposedly caused this, it was given as a reason for the blow up at Jonestown was over this, whose son it was and all. So I, uh, I'm getting to the point where I can't really tell uh, legitimate, as I say in here, legitimate suspicion from paranoia. So you start looking at everybody and wondering. And I just don't know. Thank you. Well, isn't that special? Um, well, I just have one other thing I want to show you guys. This is very important. Please look at this. Then I'll get back to you guys. Um, it's almost over, guys. Just this little clip here. I won't read this. I'll let you read it yourself, friends. For obvious reasons. Well, there you go, guys. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and go, but I want to just ask you guys for a favor. If When you watch this and you you uh, see this and you think, well, this is really important and, and the world should know this. This is important for the world to know. And bring to your mind the fact that my videos are almost not getting out to anyone. And, you know, remember, not very long ago of, a few years ago, my videos went thousands upon thousands, every video, up to millions of clicks. Think about the fact that most everyone else that's trying to help the world understand these things has been taken off of YouTube. And right now, the only reason I'm on here is because they're shadow banning me, which is something that, you know, you've heard of, but what it means is that they're do not, they don't allow this to get out to anyone. The only reason that anyone comes here is because they already know who I am. They don't promote this channel. So if you wouldn't mind, if you think that this is important, please let everyone know about this information. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and go, guys. Hope you have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.